Well, hello, Sagu. It's good to be here again. I do just want to correct one thing that Dr. Uglo said. Um, I didn't actually graduate from Harvard. I kind of took classes there. Uh, my master's is actually from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. But I went to Harvard. I snuck in, and they kind of count me as one of theirs. I'm like Rahab, but not a prostitute. Um, <laughs> with that, we should talk about other things in the Bible. Uh, when Dr. Uglo emailed me and said, what should we do for a theme this year? Uh, we're going to go with the unearthed idea that we've, we've done in the past. What do you want to do? What do you think we should do with this? And I thought, well, we've been to Jerusalem. We've been to Corinth. We've done big historical events like Lachish. We've been to Telesophy. We talked about David and Goliath and uh, the massive destruction and the excavations that Sagu's done there. But we haven't taken the time to really get in to the little details of daily life. And so I thought maybe we should do some of the common elements. And so that's how we ended up at this theme of agriculture, art, and architecture. These are basic things. Uh, you go to any culture in the world in any time, and these are elements of life. And the idea behind this seminar was to say, what happens when we look at these common elements and put them uh, in the context of the Bible? What can that tell us? And I think what you'll see over the next few days is that we come up with some uncommon insights. Okay, you see what I'm doing there? I get paid every time I say uncommon, right? You know the theme. So today we're talking about God, oil, and politics, ancient agriculture, and the Old Testament. I grew up in Kansas. I'm a Kansas kid. Uh, when I think about growing up and I think about the summers, this is what I picture. Okay, you haven't seen anything prettier than a ripe wheat field with like an angry thunderstorm sky and lightning going behind it. Okay. It's gorgeous. But for those of you that have grown up in agricultural communities, you know that uh, the life cycle kind of revolves around this, right? That we get summer breaks so that we can have harvests and stuff like this. Um, in ancient Israel, we're operating on a very similar thing. We're talking about an agricultural community with an agricultural economy. They don't get things if they don't grow them, right? So we need fruit, we need grains, we need the animals that we're herding. Okay? And where this gets interesting for me, as a guy that's done both Bible and archaeology, is I try to come at this and straddle both worlds. You know, if you ask me what I'm interested in, at the end of the day, I'm interested in dirt and the Old Testament. You know, great personality. I want to hang out with that guy, right? <laughs> the two most boring things in the world. Um, but looking at these... Uh, we get to understand the fabric of the society that the Bible was formed in, right? That where these events take place. When we think about agriculture in ancient Israel, one of the first things that comes to mind is this tablet. We call it the Gezer calendar. Uh, it was found at Gezer, and Brian's going to talk to us about Gezer tomorrow. Um, and it's not even a calendar. It's more of a list of chores. If you look at this, it starts with two months of ingathering, two months of sowing, two months of late sowing, a month for hoeing weeds. We've got barley. We've got harvesting and measuring. We've got grapes. And then we're gathering all the fruit. Okay? Twelve months all lined up to their agricultural seasons. In ancient Israel, if it's a time of year, there's something happening agriculturally. Now, one of the things we saw in there was wheat, right? Or grain, okay? We all love our bread, right? Give me extra gluten. Um, grapes, this is another one of these staples because they loved grapes and raisins and grape juice and communion and maybe wine. Um, but we'll jump quick into olive oil, okay? Let's not get in trouble. Uh, the olive is critical in the ancient world. Uh, if you think about the Mediterranean diet, we're looking at a bunch of uh, people who base their fat intake in their diet around plant fats. Uh, whereas Europe is more animal fat based, the Mediterranean is very much plant fat, and that primary source is the olive, okay? And so we call this the Mediterranean uh, triad. We've got grain, we've got grapes, and we've got olives. And together, these kind of form the background or the backbone of this agricultural economy. So real quickly, I want to go through just a few of the things, you know, it would be a waste of time to talk about this stuff without showing some of the finds that we have that give us an insight into daily life. Uh, what you see here is a set of uh, plow points. These are actually iron plow points you can see on the right. 
And what they've done, does my laser reach that far? On the left here is a reconstruction. So they've remodeled what the sticks would look like. And basically the tip of the plow is just this metal sheath that goes on the end. Okay, and we've found collections of these, you know, the metal points sitting together. So that's the plowing phase. Uh, in the Bible, we always hear about things happening at threshing floors, people buying threshing floors. Uh, through modern ethnographic study, we have a pretty good idea of how threshing takes place, right? Before you can throw all your grain in the air and separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, you actually have to cut it up and grind it, right? Uh, if, if you're from Kansas, you know we have machines for this. And if you're from really small parts of Kansas, you know that we have steam-powered machines for this and we have festivals around them. Um, it's a thing, I promise. Okay, but look at this. We've got the little boy uh, on, on the sled, or next to the sled, and it's got a bunch of flint blades jammed into the wood. And you can see on the left, the guy's got his cows, he's pulling it. And I don't know if you can see on the very back, see the baby hanging out? Just, I lost my laser. Uh, this is a part of daily life. And this is the image that comes to mind when we talk about a threshing floor or the process of threshing. Once you've got that part of the grain, you actually have to prepare it, right? You can't make your bread just out of straight grain. You've got to make flour. What you see on the left is a grinding setup from Telesafi. This is where we dig. This is where the Sagu crew is. This is actually from Area F. Uh, and we excavated this in 2006. This is an 8th century kitchen setup. Uh, and what you see, this, the large stone here is actually the grinding stone. And right next to it is the grinder, okay? You can see in this picture, probably within the last 100 years, uh, almost the exact same setup. The pieces look identical. This long curved rock, the big handle, that side is flat, just like this one, okay? And next to it, what we found on either side, this large barrel here, and then off the picture was another one. This is for your grain on one side and your flour on the other. So we have the whole process of this grain preparation happening. And even in the last 100 years, we're still doing it the same. Okay? So this is what we think of uh, when we're talking about grain in the, in, in the biblical world. And it's such a common daily thing. Uh, you can go to Jeremiah, and he's talking about, you know, the things that are going to get wiped out. And so we're taking away the voice of joy and, you know, the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the grinding of the millstones, that sound of the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. Can you get more basic than a lamp in the ancient world and grinding? These are daily tasks, and Jeremiah is using these to emphasize this point. Now, I study agriculture. This is one of the things I'm interested in. Uh, but one of the things that makes it really difficult is that it's hard to excavate. When we go to Israel and we dig things up, like let's say we're going to dig up a giant pot. This is the biggest pot I've ever excavated. Let's say that that was full of grain at one time. When we go and we dig that up, what do we get? Dirt. Okay, we've peeled off the top of this pot just in its place, and the thing is completely filled with dirt, which makes sense. You know, the site's abandoned or destroyed, the, the pot tips over, some grain spills out. Eventually, it's going to degrade, and that's going to fill up with sediments, okay? But that makes it really hard to study the economy. We can't say, oh, they have this much grain at Gath at this time, and they have this much grain in Jerusalem. How are you going to measure it? You can't. Okay. Uh, wine, they had it. We're not going to talk about it. Uh, it's a joke. It's a joke. Uh, no, same problem. The remains are minuscule. We have some places where there's presses, but at the end of the day, wine is either consumed or it degrades. And it's very difficult to track the, the quantities without trying to count the number of vessels. It just leaves a weak... Uh, a weak analysis, but olive oil is different. Okay, when we think about olive oil in the ancient world, it's really important because it's food, like we talked about, and it's fuel, right? This is your basic, basic fuel for lighting your house. You fill up an oil lamp like this, and this is the typical oil lamp uh, that runs in the Bronze and Iron Ages, okay? Even after your oil goes bad for cooking, you can still burn it in a lamp. This stuff is everywhere. It's a daily product that everybody uses. So that's one reason why it's good for working with the economy. The second reason is that it uses really big uh, presses to make. 
Okay, this is an oil press uh, installation at Telburna. You can see this is the bedrock. They just carved their press into the bedrock. That's not going anywhere, right? At Telesafi, we've had giant things. This stone on the right, the big circle one, was like a meter across. The thing on the left is a press weight. And just to give you an idea, what they're lifting it out of the square with is uh, a, a, like a crane that you would use for an engine block. People that work on cars, like a hydraulic winch, we broke it. Okay, so this, this stone was that heavy. Eventually we broke the tailgate off a truck and the tail light, but that, we got in trouble. The idea here is these presses, the things that you use to make olive oil in the ancient world are so big, they don't go away. So we call them durable remains, right? They persist in the archeological record. If you look at the one up here, that's basically a limestone bathtub for mashing olives. It's a meter across. If we go off the tell and into the lower city, you can see right here, this is the same type of press vessel right on the surface. And you can see olive trees in the background. So this is a new area that we're opening at Telesafi next year. We're really excited about it. Uh, if you wanna come with us and dig this, it's gonna be really cool. Uh, I'm excited. Okay, so you get the idea here. Grain is difficult to work with. We know that it's critical. Wine is really tricky to track. But with olive oil, we have these giant presses and we know that in every period of time, you have to have olive oil. One of the most critical sites for understanding olive oil production during Bible times is a site called Ekron. And it's right in the middle of this map. Catch it with the laser there. Feel like a Jedi as I shoot lasers to both sides. Uh, this is Ekron, and what we have at Ekron, you can see it here from a satellite map, it's not impressive. It's the little square that's under this push pin, okay? Doesn't look like much. If we zoom in a little bit, still doesn't look like much, but you can see there's fields around it even today, so nice fertile area. Why Ekron is important is because in the seventh century BC, uh, it develops a really impressive olive oil industry. So here's a topographical map of the tell. And the tell is just a mound. That's when I say tell, I'm talking about the city. All of these dots around the bottom of the tell actually represent oil presses. At this time, in the seventh century, Ekron suddenly decides to make olive oil. Okay, and we have over 200 presses around the base of the tell. Ekron's also famously known for this temple complex. It becomes a big administrative center. Uh, and actually, this is a lot of fun because it was excavated by our friend Steve Ortiz just up the road at Southwest Baptist. Where we actually stay for Telesafi and the crew that was with us know these. Uh, these are actually the pillar bases from that sanctuary that was just outlined in yellow. They actually line the driveway of where we stay. So they've been kind of recycled. And we walk by them every night on the way to dinner. They're just laying around, you know, ancient history. It's there. The thing with olive oil production, though, this is liquid gold, okay? Absolutely important to daily life. And when Ekron starts producing olive oil this time, uh, it changes the world, and I'm not joking. So how do you make olive oil? When we excavate presses, this is the typical setup we find. The first thing you have is this central crushing basin. So you mash the olives there. Then on either side, you have these two uh, press vats, okay? You put the olives on there to smash them, and you would use uh, heavy weights, pierced stone weights, to weight the beam to crush them, okay? If we reconstruct this, what we end up with is actually, let it catch up here. We've got the three pieces, and with a reconstruction, that's what you're looking at, okay? So you see the parts. You've got the big crushing basin in the middle. You've got the vats on either side that you're gonna press into. And then a long wooden beam is weighted down by these stone weights uh, that drains, helps drain the oil out. If you go to the site today, it's overgrown, it's sad looking, uh, but this is what it looked like this summer. And you can still see these presses on the surface. You know, like I said, there's 200 of them just, just littered around. So this is Ekron. To go into more detail about how you make these, I want to give you a close-up and actually show you pictures of the process, because it's not what we get on the table at Olive Garden is not 
not how it comes out. And you'll see that in a second. So this is the crushing basin. Uh, dump your raw olives in, they've been washed. And the way they're mashing them at Ekron is they're using a stone roller, okay? So that standing up thing, the long white thing in the middle, actually has pierced ends. And they would actually put a handle on it and you push and pull it like this. So that's how you mash your olives. After that, uh, and this is a, a picture of a modern process, you slightly later ancient style press. Um, you can see nice ripe olives being poured in. Uh, the weight will roll around and crush them. And what it creates is a mash, okay? And this mash has to be loaded somehow onto the press vat to collect the oil. So what we do is we load them into these woven baskets made of plant fiber, right, or, or animal hair. And once we load this mash in, you can see it's already disgusting stuff. This is not beautiful golden olive oil. This is green sludgy mush that we're packing into the baskets. These are then carried over, stacked on the actual pressing vats, Right, we know these from Ekron. And then pressure is applied. So we add the weights to the end. This one you can see actually has a hole so that the weights can drop down into it. At Ekron, they probably just winched them up high enough because you don't need to get all the pressure just enough to put the weight on the olives. And as that weight is applied, the oil starts to run out. Like I said, icky stuff, right? It doesn't come out pretty because part of what comes out is a wastewater. Okay, so you're getting oil, but you're also getting this like sticky red liquid that's coming out with it, and you actually have to let that separate, okay? And then after it's separated out, you can come and skim the oil off the top. So that's how we actually make the olive oil. So we had 200 presses at Ekron, and we gotta put that in context. There's a guy by the name of David A. Tom that worked with this project uh, through the 80s and 90s, and he tried to model what this would actually mean in terms of the production volume for an annual cycle. So with these 200 presses, he estimated that it was gonna take 35,000 olive trees. And if you know anything about olive trees, you know they don't grow fast. I think I saw the ones out here at Sagu looking a little stubby. I don't, they're a little shorter than I remember them, okay? 2,000 workers, which may be a little high, but the big number is this, 245,000 liters of olive oil a year. That's a lot of olive oil, okay? And this is going, we know it's going by the Phoenicians as far as Southwest Siberia. They're taking this from Israel all the way to Spain. How big is 245,000 liters? When you're driving down the highway, you go into the gas station, you see a big gas truck. The average tanker truck in the US holds around 34,000 liters. What that means for Ekron is that in an annual production cycle, and remember the harvest is just ha happening like October, November, this one side is producing seven tanker trucks. That's a tanker truck a week. And that tanker truck is being filled by this trickle, right? Okay, so you with me? <laughs> in every week, this primitive site using primitive methods uh, we're using rocks and sticks <laughs> and crushing things. We're filling up one of these a week with olive oil and then shipping it to Spain. This is incredible. Now you're sitting here and you're like, okay, Eric, I love my bread, I love my gluten, I love grape juice, I love communion. I even love going to Olive Garden, but what you told me you were gonna do something with Bible. So we reconstruct this picture of the ancient world. Like I said, I try to straddle both sides. I wanna be in the biblical world, I wanna understand it. I wanna be in the dirt, I wanna understand it. So how does this all come back? In the ninth century, we have the Assyrian Empire, okay? These guys end up being bad guys in the Bible. And they start to undergo a process of westward, exp westward expansion. So you can see this red here, it's starting to kind of bleed over. Um, the homeland in Iraq, you, you know the city Nineveh, uh, very much in the news lately. And as this spreads over and to the west through Syria, what is now Lebanon, and down into Israel, uh, cities are destroyed. They're caught up in the wake of this destruction. And eventually the Assyrian Empire is going to encompass this entire region shaded in the light blue. Judah will not be immune. As we saw in a previous uh, seminar, the city of Lachish, for example, is completely destroyed. This is what olive oil production looks like in the eighth century in Israel. If we go around and plot all the different sites where we find these big basins 
uh, and these uh, crushing vats and the press vats, we come up with a map that looks like this. But then our friend Sennacherib comes, okay? Sennacherib comes in like a wrecking ball, and he does just that, okay? Look at this. 46 of Hezekiah's cities I surrounded and conquered. What I spoiled, I parceled out and gave away. I reduced his country. He comes in, destroys all of Judah, basically. And then the land that he takes, he basically hands over to the Philistines. These are Philistine kings. Uh, king of Ashdod, king of Ekron, king of Gaza. Okay? He's handing the lands over to the Philistines on the coast and saying, you guys run the show. And what that means is that the olive oil system is completely rebooted. All of the cities that were previously producing don't produce anymore. And now the archaeology shows us that at this time in the seventh century after Sennacherib, Ekron suddenly starts making olive oil. No olive oil production to 200 presses. Okay? Look at the maps. This is a huge change. And you have to ask yourself, what's happening in Judah at this time? The people of Judah who were traditionally farming for themselves, right? They're family-oriented farms around a patrilineal structure. They're growing olives and family trees, pressing them at a community pressing center. And the oil serves their needs and kind of their family unit and maybe their village or region. And now suddenly we're plugged into this industrial system where one side is controlling the production, making these seven tanker trucks worth of oil, and it's shipping all the way to Spain. So little Judah, who's like the mom and pop oil shop, making enough to get by, is suddenly thrust into this global world where we're supposed to have oil going all the way to Spain. And that changes things. And this is the context that the Bible's being written in. Look at this uh, oracle from the book of Zephaniah. Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. And you're like, Eric, I don't preach Zephaniah because it's Zephaniah. I, I don't know how you preach destroying cities and what that means. Let's talk about it. Traditionally, uh, this passage has a few things going on. I'll pop back just a second. I'll read the first part and the last part in Hebrew. It says, Ki aza azuva. Okay, for Gaza will be forsaken. And the last part, ve'akron te'aker. Now, you don't even have to speak Hebrew to hear what's happening. Okay? Ki aza azuva. They sound the same, right? You hear azuva, right? You hear that? And you hear ve'akron te'aker. All those sounds are there. Visually, you can match up the letters. There's something happening. There's a play on words. Traditionally, uh, people got really hung up on this in biblical scholarship. They said... Well, the middle cities don't get that. Ashkelon and Ashdod don't get cool puns on their names. Maybe the text is corrupt. So we start making all these uh, new versions of the text and saying, well, it was probably originally this and it got dropped out. No, thank you. Uh, there's another one that says, well, this is really setting up the Philistines as this barren woman. And this is why I have the woman here crying over her olive tree. You know, first she's run out of town, and then she's rejected, and it ends with this, you know, barren woman who can't bear, bear children. And it's like, okay, now we're, like, we're really stretching. It kind of works, but not really. And then there are other people who just, you know, read it on a pure literary level. They say, well, there's only four Philistine cities. And if you're an ancient studies major, or hopefully Bible, you know that there are five Philistine cities. There's a big one that's missing. Gath, right? And as a guy who digs at Gath, I take offense to this. Um, so these people come out with these interpretations. Why, why would you leave Gath out? And they say, well, it's just literary. What do you mean it's just literary? They were doing poetry so they could only fit sets of two, and it was just inconvenient to have the fifth, so they left it out. Well, unless you've been living under a rock, we've, we know where Gath is, and what we know is that it's not left out. It's not Philistine. That's why it's not there. Uh, we've talked about this in the past at the seminar, that in the ninth century, Hazael comes in and destroys the city of Gath. It's mentioned in the book of Kings. And it ceases to be Philistine. So it's Judean now. Okay, So there's no reason for the author of Zephaniah to get angry at the city of Gath. He doesn't need to throw it in there because Judah already holds it. Okay, 
Ekron shall be uprooted. That's an interesting choice of words. The Ekron te aker. He said, Ekron will be uprooted. Nothing fancy there. It's actually the opposite of the word to plant. Go figure. When you read in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to plant and a time to uproot. These are the two words. Nata and akar. Akar. Okay? Well, that doesn't seem that foreign. I mean, look at the Bible. God's uprooting people all the time. It's kind of something he does, right? The Lord uprooted them from their land. Behold, I will pluck them up from their land. They shall never again be uprooted out of the land. That's a nice one, actually. That's the the peaceful ending to Amos, okay? But this idea that people could be punished by being uprooted from their land, rooted out, driven, plucked away, okay? So when we read Zephaniah, it's like, well, that's not a big deal. God's always plucking people. When we actually go to those texts, though, and it's people that are being plucked, we're using the word natash, okay? Like we said, a car was our uprooting a plant. Nata was our planting. Natash. So in the Old Testament, if somebody is going to be uprooted, we natash people, but we akar a plant. Does that make sense? You don't have to speak Hebrew as long as you speak pictures. We have two concepts here. We have a word for people being picked up and driven out of their land, and we have one for plants that come up. Okay? So it's funny when we get to Zephaniah, and the author is going through all these things. Sure, cities get deserted. That's fine for Gaza to have that happen. Um, Ashkelon can be a desolation. Ashdo, the people can be driven out of the city. Ekron can be uprooted. Wait a second. We don't pluck up, plant uproot people. We drive them out, right? There's just different word happening here. And the funny thing is, is it goes beyond just a cute play on Ekron's name, right? Because as you just saw, um, we have managed to use a word that strikes right at the heart of Ekron's industry. Okay, when the author does this, yeah, he gets ki aza azuva and ve ekron te aker, these cute play on words. He makes a good thing. But this is like a double whammy. He gets them. If you're making seven tanker trucks of olive oil a year, to now look at the city and say, you know what? God's going to pluck you out of the ground. You know what? The way you kill an olive tree is to uproot it. If you cut it, it'll keep growing, okay? We'll see them where they get burned and the shoots will come back up off the roots. The way you kill an olive tree is to pluck it up and root it out. So now when we're reading Zephaniah, we're bringing in this whole new level of meaning once we understand the ancient world. Look at that map again. From everything to nothing. This is where God, oil, and politics meet, okay? We have the writer of the Old Testament talking about something that seems very political. He's very angry at these people. Uh, But the root cause of the problem, see what I did there, root, is this olive oil industry, right? It's been moved. But that's not the end of the story, okay? If you read the rest of Zephaniah, things change around, okay? And you, O sea coast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The sea coast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze, and in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. So he's talking about the coast, he's talking about the Philistines. For the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. Now we just said, when Sennacherib comes in in 701, and destroys everything, lays waste to all of Judah. Judah's coming back. They have to rebuild. They're not getting the olive oil production back. That's Ekron's now. All the lands have been handed over to the Philistines. And they're looking out and they're saying, God, what are we going to do? We've lost our livelihood. This is our traditional livelihood, and it's been handed over. And so you get this poem saying... From the, from the author of Zephaniah saying, there's coming a day, ki aza azuva, Gaza will be forsaken, ekron teaker, and ekron will be uprooted. And we say, you know what, seacoast Philistines, you're going to be our pastures. Do you see the flip that's happening here? 
It's not going to be our land that's going to be serving you. There's coming a day when things are going to be the other direction. We're going to move into Philistia, and Judah's fortunes, Judah's economy will be restored. So the big takeaway from today, the thing, if I could get anything through to you, is that even in the most mundane, the most common elements, something as simple as diet, if we study that, can open up new parts of, of the biblical world. Today we looked at olives. But what we saw is a huge structural shift happening uh, between one period and the other. We saw people that had lost their livelihood and were suddenly sitting there going, what do we do next? We saw an author who looked to the people and said, you know what? It's going to change. For Zephaniah, not only is God aware of the loss of their daily stuff, uh, the thing that makes their world function, he's able to restore it. Okay, and that's where this comes full circle. Okay, it's, it's that God is aware of their daily needs. And simple, something as simple as the economy, something as simple as their jobs and their livelihood can be restored uh, in this coming day. And that's what I have for you this morning.